Okay, so looks like we um, have enough people to get started. Um, so bear with me, I'm Leah Prescott, and um, this is, as we'll talk a little bit later, um, I'll be one of the new co-chairs for the coming, at least coming year, for, um, for the infrastructure group. And it turned out that Nathan couldn't be here and Sarah Dorpinghouse couldn't be here. So um, <laughs> trial by fire here. Um, so today we're going to be talking about cost modeling for digital preservation. And we have uh, two talks, uh, one from Julian Morley from uh, Stanford and one from uh, a talk by Kate Doey and David Durden from Maryland. So um, let, we're going to start with Julian. Um, we expect that these will go 15, 20 ish minutes or so, and hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the end. And then hopefully also we have a little bit of uh, working group business. So hopefully we'll have a little time uh, to go into that. So uh, we're going to start with Julian, who is the operations manager for the digital library systems and services at Stanford. And this was a talk from the 2019 PASIG, which I believe was in Mexico City, right? That's right. Yeah. So take it away, Julian. All right. Thank you, Leah. Okay. So um, yes, I'm Julian Moy. I work for Stanford Libraries. I run IT operations for libraries, and part of um, my responsibilities is preservation storage. So before we get really into the weeds here, I just want to say that this is obviously this is the Stanford's way of how we model our preservation cost storage. And whilst I think there are going to be some interesting tidbits that will come out of this, um, I fully understand that this won't necessarily apply to everyone who's out there. So let's do some scene setting. Um, digital preservation at Stanford. Uh, as I say, um, I work for the libraries and we run the SDR, the Stanford Digital Repository. It's uh, just a touch over 700 terabytes right now. And we're projecting that to double in size next year. Um, and that's because we have a policy where our digital collections are seen as a strategic resource for the university and that must be preserved for future generations. And that means that we are digitizing and ingesting all of our print material and putting that into the SDR. <clears throat> so one thing that we got out of PASIC was this definition of digital preservation uh, that said that uh, digital preservation is strategy and actions to preserve access to content. So for Stanford, our ground rules include the, the notion that preservation is meaningless without access. We cannot just place this content on a tape and then forget about it. You need to be able to get at it. Uh, preservation also means multiple copies of that data to protect against the loss of any one copy. And data sovereignty is a strategic imperative for us. We cannot hand all of our data over to third parties. We have to have control over it uh, in a very meaningful sense. I, I don't want to, it really means that um, I have to be able to go to a data center and touch my data, just like I could go to the library and touch a book. It's fine if I have other copies elsewhere, but at some point on the line, I need to be able to touch the hard drive that has some of our data in it. And also, we're in this for the long term. Um, obviously, digital preservation is a new field, uh, so we haven't been doing it for very long, but we have books that are five, 600 years old. We need to be thinking along the same kinds of timescales for our digital assets. So continuity planning is vital for long-term preservation. So we can't just stick with the normal software um, update cycles of three to five years and then it's obsolete. We need to have a plan to keep that going for decades. So what does that look like on the ground at Stanford? Well, from the access perspective, it means we have to keep one copy on spinning disk. For sovereignty, we need at least one copy on Stanford hardware. So we roll that into the spinning disk copy. For the preservation side of things, we need at least three copies. We actually have four. Um, and for those preservation copies, at least two of them need to be out of state. As you may be aware, Stanford is in California. We're right on the San Andreas Fault. It would be nice if we didn't lose all of that if Stanford falls into a hole in the ground. Uh, we also need to perform regular content audits and fixity. We do need to make sure that our stuff is still there and that it hasn't degraded over time. And from a continuity perspective, we have to avoid vendor monoculture. We cannot be locked into uh, any one solution uh, that would enable a vendor to sort of tighten the screws on us and extract money and decrease our ability to preserve data out of us. 
Um, so that also means we'd have to have a plan to add and drop vendors over time. And again, long-term time scale, five to 10 years, how do we move from storage provider A to storage provider B if prices change, if new technology comes along? We need to plan for that. So that so we end up with um, an architecture that looks very broadly like this. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, online access and preservation copy in Stanford, on Stanford land in Stanford data centers. And then we have three remote copies going to two different vendors um, distributed across the continental US. Uh, we have two copies going to AWS Deep Archive, one of them up in Oregon and one across on the East Coast in Virginia. And then we're sending an, a copy to IBM Cloud Object Storage Vault Archive, <laughs> that's a bit of a mouthful, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, what's missing from this slide is the, the glue that handles the creation and distribution of those archive copies. We actually wrote our own software called Preservation Catalog that handles that, but that's kind of outside the scope of this talk. So archive storage, the cloud, uh, let's talk about our choices here. We decided pretty early on that we were just gonna focus on the S3 API uh, because we were developing the software in-house, uh, writing code that would support you know, S3 and um, the Azure API and the GCP Google Cloud Platform API it was too much of an engineering lift for us. So we focused purely on the S3 API and that still gave us access to multiple different vendors. So we satisfied our multi-vendor, multi-location criteria that way. Uh, once we looked at that list, we also had to look for vendors that only provided a cloud or a cloud tape product. That's purely a, a, a cost decision. Um, S3, even S3 in frequent access is way too expensive when you're talking about making three copies of the stuff. Um, we also needed a, a vendor that uh, had data centers outside of California. That's not a big deal. Everyone has data, data centers across the US. And also we needed published pricing with no significant ingest costs. There were some vendors out there that had storage that might have hit our criteria, but they did not publish their pricing and we did not wish to get into you know, a multi-month uh, series of negotiations to, to lock in a price. That was just, just not agile enough for us. Anyway, after all that was said and done, we ended up with um, Amazon, IBM, Oracle, and Wasabi as potential vendors. Uh, Wasabi has that little asterisk there because they're not technically a cold product. They're actually, it's, it's warm data on spinning disk, but they're cheap enough that they're a contender. Um, their warm storage price works out, I think it's seven cents a gig a year with no egress charges. So that's still more expensive than Amazon Glacier by a, quite a bit, but it's a lot less expensive if you actually need to re recall that data on site. Uh, we looked at Dell and Iron Mountain as well. They have an S3 cloud product, but they don't have a cold tier and they're a lot more opaque about their pricing. And as I say, Microsoft, Google, and Backblaze, they do not have an S3 API, so we couldn't consider that. <clears throat> For the local disk, we're looking at, or we, are, we have looked at, and are implementing uh, software-defined storage uh, that are running on commodity hardware. Now the key part of SDS is that you can add capacity in increments as small as one server. So you're not tied to this sort of once a year storage purchase of four to six shells of disk, uh, which often involves a very lengthy negotiation process with your vendor. And you will end up with, you know, potentially a, you know, a petabyte's worth of storage just sat in your data center, not being used for a long time so you fill it up. So we like the idea of being able to have multiple purchases over the course of the year and sort of doing just in time, not really, but relatively just in time um, procurement of new storage. Now, you could do this with a traditional network attack storage device. That's what we used to use. Uh, but we found that at scale, network attack storage from a commercial vendor is prohibitively expensive. Um, I, mean, I don't want to, to name and shame here, but if you, you pick a big name, you'll probably encounter that. Um, there are also uh, vendor locked solutions for SDS. Uh, that follow these, this whole upgrade by node model, but you have to buy the hardware from the vendor. So Dell ECS and NetApp Storage Grid are examples of that. They're great products, but you end up paying Dell and NetApp prices for your hard disks. And one of the advantages of SDS to us is that we could buy uh, our hard drives from the cheapest possible vendor. And that really does drive down uh, costs. Now SDS gives you the option to um, that use many different protocols. Um, the big ones for us are S3 and NFS, but you could also do iSCSI. 
and some of them also have um, dedicated fuse clients to do their own thing. One thing we found is that there's really no one product that does all of these well, so you do have to know your use cases and your, your target systems and, and pick the SDS that provides the right blend of protocols for you. Uh, that said, picking an SDS is hard, and I'm not going to go into how you should do it here because that could be an entirely different talk. Um, and as, as with everything in life, it depends. Uh, so just very, very high level questions that you could ask. You've got to know your access patterns and your clients. You've got to know how any one particular SDS solution handles metadata and caching. You've got to know your file system requirements. Like, do you need a single global namespace for all your preserved content or can you use multiple buckets? Will you be storing billions of files in that global namespace and, and, and so on. It can get really complex and there are many great solutions out there that don't necessarily meet your particular use case. So you, you do have to go into to quite a amount of research to, to pick the right one for you. So let's uh, start breaking this down to the actual cost model. Uh, I'm going to assume that we're implementing a hypothetical Ceph cluster. Um, this would also work for Gluster and a bunch of the other um, uh, SDS, open source SDS um, solutions that are out there. What you need to know going in is what a, a single node configuration is going to look like um, and the pricing capacity that it's going to provide to your cluster as you incrementally add nodes. You also need to have some idea about how your data is going to be ask, ac accessed because there is this trade off between um, storage density and cores in any one particular node. Um, Ceph, for example, usually requires or they recommend that you have one processing thread available per hard disk in a storage node, but that's negotiable depending on your access patterns. So if you're looking at a more archival um, storage system and you are not using erasure coding, you can get away with a lower ratio of cores to disk. You also have to have some idea about the amount of new storage you're going to have to add to your cluster over the course of a year. And, and crucially, especially as the cluster is ages, you have to look at how much old storage you need to replace um, over the years. Um, you probably have, if you have a data center, you're probably looking at um, some, some sort of overhead to pay your data center folks for the services they provide you, so you need to know about that. And with SDS, if you have commercial support for the SDS, you need to know what that licensing is going to look like and what the support looks like. So I'm going to be assuming 2019 prices, and I'm going to assume that storage costs are going to decrease over time and that storage density will increase. So again, looking at a, at a, at a potential set cluster here, um, using a 60 bay 4U super micro super storage server, this is the kind of thing that you end up shaking out when you, when you sort of work out all the variables. Um, if we assume that year one is 2019 in this, in this chart, you'll see that we could get one of these 60 disk storage servers with 12 terabyte disks in, gives you 720 terabytes of raw storage in that, um, in that single node. Um, if you're using erasure coding and you have many of these nodes, each incremental node that you add is going to give you about 400, 430 terabytes worth of new capacity to your cluster. If you're using three-way replication, you get less, only about 216, 220 terabytes worth of data for each node. But obviously, to start off, you need more than one node, um, depending on whether you're going for erasure coding or replication, anywhere from four to six nodes is basically your table stakes, just to get in the door to have a, a functional cluster. Anyway, for this Supermicro Super Storage Server, um, we like Supermicro uh, because there are many um, value-add resellers out there that will sell you exactly the same hardware and they will compete on price. So you can get a true apples to apples comparison quotes. This is different from Dell, IBM, and HP, where usually there's, you're going direct to the vendor and there's, you just get what they give you. Um, so if you're interested in trying to drive down prices, uh, going with, with Supermicro uh, or maybe Quanta is, is something to consider because you can actually get a, a, you know, a perfect comparison quote. <clears throat> I'm also taking a a fairly conservative swag at hard drive growth here. Um, I'm assuming that next year I'll be able to get 14 terabyte drives for the same price, the year after 16 terabytes and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, I think being conservative about these things is the way to go. And I think that we're going to stay on spinning disk for at least the next five years, even though SSDs are cheap. I don't think they're going to get that cheap at this capacity to be useful in preservation. Speaking of growth, again, this is a hypothetical cluster. This is not actually Stanford's cluster. But assuming that you're starting with a petabyte of data that you need to preserve today and that it's going to grow 30% year on year, you need to over-provision your cluster so that you have enough capacity to handle failover and enough capacity to handle future growth before you run out of nodes. Because it does take time to buy new nodes, to rack them and to integrate them into your cluster. And depending on how fast you can do that, that will depend on how much headroom you should have when you're doing your projections. 10% uh, is pretty much as low as I would go. Uh, if you have a really slow procurement process, I would do 20, 25%, maybe more. So bringing these, uh, those two tables together, we get some idea about what um, a very, very simple um, uh, preservation timeline would look like for this, for this cluster. As you see, we start off at year one with a petabyte of preserved data. Year five, we're ending with almost three petabytes. And um, every year we're adding new nodes. Each individual node gives us more storage each year. And we are great for years one through three. And then year four, all of a sudden, we are replacing more than 50% of our capacity as our year one drives start to age out. So that's something that when we were talking to our financial people, we had to, uh, this is why this model is useful, we had to really, you know, really stress to them that whilst it might look cheap, especially in year two or three, that doesn't mean that it's always gonna be that price. That over, over the years, the costs of running the cluster will change and there is this, this speed bump as old content starts to age out. So um, if you are able to follow this URL, this basic storage model URL, you're welcome to do so. Um, I'm going to drop out of the, the presentation and go to the model directly. So let's, hopefully this will work. Give this a shot. Can folks still see my still see my screen? I hope so. Yep. Excellent. Um, so this is the very close to the actual model that we uh, um, ended up using. Uh, as you can see at the top, we have uh, projections through year eight, starting at a petabyte, thirty percent year-on-year growth. Um, I've got my over-provisioning ratio here that can be changed. And also down here, anything in blue basically is, 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 is tweakable. The number of nodes that we could expect to store in any one rack. And um, any additional costs uh, that are associated with your data center or with your racks uh, that you need to take into account. Here's my SDS node pricing. You see it's set up here for um, the 60 node, 35 grand super micro boxes. And the price is staying the same, but the capacity of the drives is changing as the years go by. I don't know if we scroll down a little bit here. We get down to the money shot. Let's lay here. We have 23, 235,000 for a year one startup cost. And then as you see, it drops off precipitously. Year two and three, it looks like we're doing great. And then year four and year five, things start to age out. And we need to not only procure new storage, um, and by that time, year four, new storage, 30% of like two and a half petabytes is a lot more than 30% of one petabyte. And also fix the fact that we have 1.3 petabytes worth of storage expiring that year from our year one purchases. So that's kind of like the, the shock factor that, that our finance folks had to uh, internalize. Now there's a block here for software licensing. Uh, this is say deliberately vague because if you go down the path of looking at a commercial soft uh, SDS solution or negotiating for commercial support of Ceph or Gluster, this will vary wildly. Um, but I will say this, when we did this with real quotes and stressing again, this is not a real quote. When we did this with real quotes, we came across a very unpleasant truth, which was that as the years went by, we were spending an increasingly large fraction of our total costs just on software licensing. And the software licensing component um, did not scale as, it scaled linearly, it did not, we, we saw no advantage of scale. So we were paying the same license per terabyte for 
the second, the 2000th terabyte of data as we were for the first terabyte of data. And that's great for the commercial vendors. It's not so great for us when we are looking to realize um, economies of scale. So that's something to watch out for. And down here, we have the cloud costs of storing this data. Um, I have my three vendors here have um, AWS Glacier. This is, again, this is the price for AWS Glacier. AWS Deep Archive, as you can see, is like 25% the price of AWS Glacier. So I totally recommend you use Deep Archive, not Glacier. And IBM's Cloud Object Store is here. And what I'm looking at here is, so as I say, we want to do fixity and, um, and validation of the content we send to the cloud, but we cannot realistically check all of the data that we send to the cloud. It's impossible. So we are trusting that um, between the three copies of the cloud that we are sending out there, if we experience data loss on site, at least one of those copies is going to be recoverable. I tried to run the numbers on what the chances were of all three cloud copies in three different locations with two different vendors returning bad bits for any one file. And I, I ran out of nines. So we feel that it is not practical or indeed required that we have to check all of our content. That said, we will spot check. We are spot checking the content, both to make sure that we are facile with recovery processes. We need to know that we can just get back a, an object if it goes bad anyway, locally. And, but also just to really verify that yes, we never see checks of errors recovering content from these cloud providers. Now, none of them will say exactly what goes on behind the screens, um, but it's tape and it's two copies of tape um, in each of these locations. So we're happy with that. We're happy with anywhere from three to six copies of our, of our content being on tape spread across the US. We think that's, that's good and we're willing to pay that price for it. Anyway, and we end up with um, total preservation costs, as you can see down here at the bottom. Um, it starts to get a little crazy once you get past year five. Um, but also, we're storing three petabytes of data, four copies of three petabytes of data, including one on disk. And so it's actually it's not a not a bad price. Um, and finally, I should just show. Here we go. This is perhaps the most important graph. Um, I have a best fit blue line for our total plus the cost, and then I have the red line of our preserved data size. The total plus the cost is linear, that's great. The red is not, it is, it is it's not exponential, um, but it's definitely an upwards curve. That's what you want to see. If these are both straight lines, you've got a problem. You wanna be able to store more data per dollar over time than, um, uh, than you are today. Uh, and if you're not doing that, you, you know, you've done something wrong, but you have, a, you have an issue to address because otherwise this, this just does not scale. You, uh, we can't afford it. Uh, I assume other people can't afford it anyway. Um, if you want to use this spreadsheet, feel free to make a copy and, and, and go nuts. But as I say, I, I think this is mostly useful for Stanford internally and to give other people ideas about how they would implement it at their institutions facing the same problem space. And with that, uh, I think I'm done. So if there's any questions, I think we've got a few minutes for that. Um, why don't we um, let Kate and David go ahead and then we'll do questions at the end, if that's okay. Works for me. But Kate Doey, um, former colleague for, um, here at Georgetown is now at the University of Maryland as the digital programs and in, in the manager of digital programs and initiatives. And she is joined by David Durden, who is the data services librarian also at the University of Maryland. And they're going to be um, covering a summary of their 2018 IPRES talk on their cost modeling calculator. So take it away. All right. Uh, so let me see if I can work it out so that we're not bouncing all over the place. So uh, why don't we, while Kate's um, working on that, why don't we take the time, if anybody does have questions for Julian? Uh, <laughs> So I see in the chat uh, from Dan Noonan. So the cost is the cost of a small island. <laughs> Smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from anyone? And people are welcome to throw questions in the chat too. We yeah. Can, if we have to fire back up with Kate, we can at least capture 
the questions there. Circle around. I introduced myself as one of the new co-chairs. Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so this is Matt Schultz. Um, I'm the Director of Digital Preservation and Curation over at uh, Educopia Institute, uh, formerly with Grand Valley State University. Um, I'm coming on board as a fresh co-chair here with the Infrastructure Group with, uh, with Leah, uh, but I'm also uh, co-chairing this year with uh, Deb Verhoff uh, from NYU over on the Content Majors Group. Um, and we are, in case folks didn't catch this, uh, the cloud study subgroup that we have had running for a couple of years, uh, we are uh, integrating with the infrastructure interest group. Um, and so that's exciting. Uh, there's already lots of um, good cloud focused uh, topics that uh, surface here on the infrastructure group. And um, as we get time to touch on it um, and turn to the uh, topic poll, um, I think folks will see there's a whole bunch that's queued up uh, for the coming year here as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Leah, what do you think? Do you think we should hop into the, oh, looks like maybe Kate's. Well, while people are waiting, if you have not clicked on the 2020 meeting topics, you might want to take a minute to do that now, because hopefully if there's time, we'll uh, talk a little bit about those topics and, uh, and um, see about getting a schedule for the coming year. So uh, that, that would be good. And the other thing that if we have time we'll cover is our, hopefully we'll cover this and maybe even before the topics because there's a little bit of a time crunch for this, uh, is our the charge for the working group. So if you have not um, taken a look at that recently, uh, while we're waiting for Kate, if you wanna take a look at that, that would be useful so we can make a decision about whether there's any changes that need to be made to the charge for the group. Um, why don't we touch on the topic list um, real quick here okay. um, and give folks some orientation to what they're seeing there. Um, folks who have access to the agenda, and we, um, one thing we should have done, I think, here, um, if it's necessary, I think most folks get their hands on it if they haven't already, but we'll put the agenda in the chat. Um, so while Kate is sending over her slides to Leah, um, Folks go ahead and take a look at the topic list. Um, this has uh, closing out on uh, Tricitor. Um, and what folks are seeing is sort of the top topics of vote were um, a, a really nice turnout and support for the topic of local digital preservation levels of commitment. So different levels and tiers of digital um, preservation commitment at member organizations. Um, um, why are they broken out the way that they are in what ways and how? Um, that was suggested by Courtney. Um, got a lot of support for that. There's uh, some suggestion that maybe that's a, perhaps a shared call between the standards and practice or content interest group. Um, so that, that's gotten a, a lot of interest as uh, Leah and I have taken a look at this. Um, I think what, uh, what we've suggested as if there is potential for that one to be um, a shared call that we might wanna have some um, offline conversations, perhaps with Courtney, uh, perhaps with um, the folks that are, well, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs on the content interest group, but uh, the folks who are heading up the standards and practice interest group and um, maybe schedule that for um, sometime in the first quarter, but perhaps not the very first call. Um, we'll need some time to do that. Um, and then uh, Nathan Tallman has suggested the uh, software defined storage topic. And uh, Lee and I benefit from uh, having had some good coaching from Nathan. <laughs> this is Nathan Tallman um, before uh, hopping on today's call. And he has indicated that, oh, perfect. We're getting the slides up. Okay, so we'll, we'll hold the conversation there on the topics and um, Kate, we'll give you a chance to, Leah's, you're, Leah, you're at, the, you're at the steering wheel for the, the slides. I am. So okay. Kate, if you want to just say ding or whatever, <laughs> I will uh, turn the slides. Let me get oriented in such a way that I can see my speaker notes. So, okay. All right. So I am terribly sorry about that, everybody. Um, that's, boy, I've never had that happen before, actually. So that was fun. Um, anyways, I'm Kate Doey. I'm the manager of digital programs and initiatives at University of Maryland Libraries. Uh, once upon a time, I used to work with Leah at Georgetown University, so that's how we came to know each other. 
Um, and then I am joined today by my colleague, David Durden, who's the Data Services Librarian at University of Maryland Libraries. And he'll be jumping on, I think, more for the Q&A piece in the interest of time, especially now that we've had this whole song and dance with the presentation. Uh, I'm going to try and go pretty quickly here. So um, up to the next slide, Leah, please. All right. Sorry. Oh, it's fine. Um, so just to give you sort of like a signposting for like what this session is going to cover, it's really going to be looking at like what our local considerations were for digital preservation and cost modeling at the University of Maryland, how we came to develop our own cost calculator, um, and what we really want to see in terms of possibly wider community adoption, um, and how we can start generalizing you know and being able to apply problems of digital preservation across institutions without necessarily relying upon individual organizational expertise which is my main interest here so if we can advance me to the next slide please great um you know so it's interesting to do this on the heels of the presentation from stanford um but i would say that um you know Generally speaking, the culture at University of Maryland does not necessarily emphasize preservation as an ultimate goal. Um, it isn't written into our mission. It isn't written into our strategic plan in meaningful ways. Um, and so, you know, it's a very different environment to be working in. And even though we have a significant amount of data and the libraries has made an investment into, you know, our digital content, um, the infrastructure, I think, both institutionally as well as some of the social infrastructure has lagged behind somewhat. And I can be pretty candid about that, and I had been in our um, presentation previously at IPRES. So I'll take you through a little bit of the archiving and processing work of my department and um, also speak to some of the growth. So next slide, please. Um, these numbers are updated as of 2017 or so. Um, and they had us at about 100 terabytes of data. We grow at a rate of about 25 to 30 terabytes per year in a given year. Um, a couple of significant things have happened in the meantime. One is that um, one unit and one particular collection at the University of Maryland, the Prang Digital Archive, have previously been excluded from these numbers because they have different, um, both curatorial objectives as well as different um, funding and management. So they didn't necessarily come through my group and were counted as part of our managed digitized assets. In the time period between giving this presentation and now, we have taken that on as an additional 160, 170 terabytes of data. Um, and I think something on the order of 10 million files. Then in addition to that, what we see in terms of projected growth, we've recently received an NEH grant to digitize a pretty significant dance archive. Um, and that video archive will add, we anticipate probably another 130, 140 or so terabytes worth of data. That is still coming in through the, um, uh, vendors at this time. So I can't speak precisely to it, but we do anticipate being at about half a petabyte, I think, within three to four years at this juncture. Um, next slide, please. There you go. Oh, thank you. Um, get my own notes up. So I have been just like running off of memory on this. Anyways, um, we have a couple of different solutions that had been in play and we have something that has changed significantly in the last few months. And I'm actually going to speak, even though I'm recorded, uh, somewhat candidly to what's happened at the University of Maryland. So we had two key service providers in play. One was our division of IT and one was Academic Preservation Trust, which University of Maryland is a member of. So um, I have flagged down here at the bottom that DivIT, uh, as it's known around here, is not, has not been a viable preservation solution for us. Um, the primary reason for that is that um, the costs were inscrutable. And when I say that, what I mean is that depending on who I asked, I or asked about the cost of our actual backup and archiving services, I could get an annual difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars. That is mind boggling to me. Um, moreover, what we received um, and the way that the process worked was effectively we were sending, um, you know, typically snapshot backups to tape. 
we couldn't do any fixity checking. We had no transparency around our content. We were unable to recover items easily. It was effectively write them to tape and then never touch them again, which again, is not preservation. That's candidly, I think that's hoarding. Um, <laughs> so, um, we were kind of encountering problems on the service provider level of that. And frankly, those things have come to bear fruit. Um, earlier this year, we were told by our IT division that they were no longer going to be providing any sort of backup or archiving services. So all 221 terabytes of our content came back to us and we were told, okay, get it off tape or um, get it off the, uh, they have a, a spinning disc set up right now, basically for all of this content. Uh, get it off and move it somewhere else. You've got a couple of weeks. We've negotiated since then and those negotiations are still underway to get additional time to actually do the fixity and um, you know, base level mediation that we can possibly do. But we are effectively in crisis mode right now with that content. Um, and it is in large part because again, at the higher organizational levels, we are not as well supported as some other institutions of our size. So what's been desired by my group for the last several years has been a move towards AP Trust, which you know, maintains a really robust consortial membership um, and is a really valuable community for us. Uh, furthermore, the infrastructure for it has been far more attractive than anything that could be provided here at the University of Maryland locally. Um, but our biggest problem was, again, our scale. If we are talking about depositing north of you know, 200 terabytes to AP Trust, that's just not something that they'd be equipped to deal with immediately necessarily. And so it had always been, you know, in addition to, you know, that problem, also being able to justify it to my own organization when, again, if nobody knows how much we're paying for something, then clearly the costs aren't really mattering to somebody. Whereas with Ap Academic Preservation Trust, it was becoming a question of, you know, you know, whether or not this is going to be too expensive and too uh, sustainable. So next slide, please. Oh, frozen here, one second. Okay. All right. Um, in essence, the way that we've been doing things was unsustainable in the long term, and we kind of operated on the assumption that it was our most affordable option, even if it didn't meet, you know, base level guidance in any area for digital preservation. Um, and again, you know, I am in the midst of right now seeing that fruit, you know, or seeing that bear fruit. Um, you know, we've lacked the information to conduct some informed cost benefit analysis. And so I'd like to take you now through sort of the origins of our own prototype. So next slide, please. Um, like a lot of other organizations, what we were noticing and, you know, including um, the excellent presentation from Stanford, um, we found that oftentimes conversations about cost modeling for digital preservation have really hinged upon um, cost tracking spreadsheets, right? Um, you know, that are really specific and localized and every institution is sort of dealing with very specific issues. Um, you know, our specific cost tracking spreadsheets did have a focus on our consortial service solutions or the cost of the infrastructure. Um, but what we noticed was that they're, you know, in the process of developing and using the spreadsheets was that maybe there's a need for an easier to use forecasting tool that could be generalized across institutions in some capacity or another. So next slide, please. And to address that emerging need for a forecasting tool and to improve our own digital preservation cost estimates, we started to kind of casually work on building a calculator. Um, and I say casually because this project originated out of our library's uh, somewhat informal coding group, which is really that anybody who has a problem that could be solved by code can show up and get some support either from our software developers or from our systems librarians or from people who just know how to code things. Um, to be able to develop more effective solutions. So our application is pretty rudimentary in its current um, you know, version, but we essentially transferred our spreadsheet into a web app. So we've already started to use the cost calculator for forecasting and estimating for grant applications, which has been the primary use case as far as treating this as a communications tool. Um, our calculators also set the stage for increased transparency in terms of um, 
you know, what the real cost of keeping it is. So it serves us in talking about, you know, standing, or standing by our commitments to digital preservation and the goal of continuing to revise and improve our digital preservation strategies. So next slide, please. So this is a basic, you know, interface that we've kind of come up with, right? So the calculator is using values from a file that contains the static service data, um, you know, or the ingest rates the membership fees, the storage costs, et cetera. Um, these were current as of about late 2017, which is the last time that we worked on this in a significant way. And they were all connected or collected from publicly available resources. So this was just, you know, stood up as our proof of concept effectively. Um, and we did want to represent as much as possible um, what the, you know, membership fees would be over time being able to you know estimate the amount of time that would need to be provided for etc um next slide please so the proof of concept works um but what we would really like to do is develop and sort of achieve mvp um so the minimum viable product to benefit both like the libraries as well as the larger community so first and foremost, we'd like to improve the data model with more cost estimates from different organizations. Um, and also being able to enrich that with levels of preservation that would result in a tool that can clearly demonstrate what we're paying for and articulate that in conjunction with best practices. Uh, we'd also like to add some comparison features. So the ability to perform side-by-side -side comparison of services is beneficial in a variety of contexts, right? So. One, being able to compare current services against futures or alternative solutions, being able to compare multiple similar services against each other you know, by their costs, and being able to compare services by the level of preservation uh, capacity. So when it comes to implementing the cost tracking, of course, like our current calculations are kind of limited to fixed costs, and they don't really account for um, either inflation or changes in service costs over time. Um, we do think this is an important problem to address, but we also think the useful feature to develop at, uh, would be to add that sort of like inflation and rising cost variable uh, into the calculator so that we could actually improve the quality and appeal of the functions of the calculator. Um, more importantly, I believe, is that it also needs to account for labor, right? So if we understand digital preservation as a series of practices that are conducted by actual humans, then frankly, the cost of their time and um, expertise needs to be accounted for as part of any conversation about infrastructure, right? Um, you know, the digital preservation cost models kind of already account for, you know, or do talk about like labor as a piece of this. And so what we'd like to do is start adding raw values for the estimates of like time for individuals or importing those calculations from other applications. Um, I often think about the um, DLF assessment interest group and their digitization cost calculator as a good model for this, right? Like who's going to be doing the labor? How much time are they going to be spending on it? You know, and being able to plug those things in for a given project. I think that this could be a natural complement to that. Next slide, please. So some of our um, pretty common use cases have been, you know, both with our informal libraries coding group, um, you know, like that I kind of communicate with them is basically, you know, they took a look at like my hot mess spreadsheets and uh, decided to help me out. So I need to ballpark sort of unambiguous preservation estimates for donors and grant applications. Um, and specifically the duration of preservation that we might be committed to. And I need to be able to do that fast. Um, so oftentimes I may not necessarily be a PI. I'm sort of consulted as like a, a end of the line expert basically with how much time are we going to need to allocate to this transfer? Um, you know, and con you know, the next piece of that is, you know, what's going to be the quality of that preservation work. So next slide, please. So I tend to ballpark on kind of like two different terms, depending on what's who I'm speaking to and what they really need from me. Um, so I go through both like annual costs as well as five-year terms. And I find that that's pretty effective for in particular my development officer who doesn't really wanna know anything about the infrastructure, right? Doesn't wanna know where the stuff is going or how we're treating it, wants to know how much it's gonna cost so that they can go to a donor with that information. 
Um, we've used it to forecast our expenses for any age and IMLS grant applications, some of which we've successfully won. And being able to clearly articulate answers to preservation questions has gone a long way for both our curators as well as our uh, development officer. Next slide, please. So um, the harder part of this is really integrating digital preservation into the, dig or into the collection appraisal process all the way around. Um, and making curatorial decisions about what responsible stewardship looks like over time. Uh, and, you know, in my work, I kind of acknowledge that there's this effective and emotional component to the appraisal process. Um, and I try to work pretty hard to allay any sort of anxieties about like either levels of preservation or ranking of content. Um, but to work through the idea that different materials need different treatments over time and to try and form a communication network. So these are sort of ongoing policy and procedural discussions at Maryland. And I hope that once we have completed this migration of our digital archive, we're equipped to actually have that conversation again. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> I have a colleague who once told me that people value the work only when you tell them how much it actually costs. Um, and and he isn't wrong. So situating digital preservation in both a values and expenses context supports informed decisions throughout the life cycle and it kind of removes mysteries and it allows the distributed expertise or it allows um, people with distributed expertise to collaborate on the best path forward for either a project or a collection. Um, again, ultimately what I'm aiming for with the cost calculator is common language um, so that everybody understands you know, again, the full life cycle of content, what is required for the preservation of that content beyond just um, the infrastructure component, but as well as, you know, labor and expertise. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we're really looking for is to recruit collaborators. And, you know, we've released version 1.0 and that's available to the community via GitHub. Um, I can distribute that link because I don't think it's actually in the slides, um, but it is available. One reason that we're kind of presenting on this is to sort of solicit use cases and also sort of work to develop a conversation around what the future of this tool might be and if it's something that might be useful at other organizations. Um, like I said, you know, we currently kind of work on this as a hobby and in a very informal way. It's not a part of our main, um, you know, digital strategy overall. It's, you know, this thing that we kind of do on the side to make at least, you know, my life better, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> but what we're really looking for is maybe more people who are interested in the continuing development of the tool. Um, and we're also really ultimately looking to you know, reinforce the true value of human effort and digital preservation and get those costs represented through the model. Next slide, please. Um, you know, so ultimately, like we really do understand that this is a very specific and limited answer to a very difficult problem. Um, and it still does tend to focus the expenses and conversation about expenses for digital preservation as a technical and infrastructure problem without necessarily addressing real questions of labor. Um, but transparency within units at Maryland, you know, uh, has supported greater collaboration. And we really do think that by, you know, developing these sort of centralized cost modeling tools that has the potential to advance digital preservation discussions in concrete terms in many home and organizations. Uh, but that does require a community to support it and buy in for the product and both of providers as well as practitioners so that we can better communicate the cost and the value of keeping these things. And that is all that I have. Great. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions for Kate? I do if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do see one question um, that has anyone prepared cost models for staffing? I don't know of one. We have them, but I'm, I can't really share them. Uh, because they're tied into Stanford uh, pay and things like yes, that. Yes, correct. It's because we're in the same position. I think many people are in the same position where you have a central UIT that provides um, a, some services, and then you have your local folks who do some services, and then working out how you account for the cost of those services is, is, is a problem. 
So Kate, I'm wondering if you have um, gone far enough along that you uh, used the model for a grant application that was successful and you've been able to finish that grant and see how accurate the calculator ended up being. Ooh, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's a good question. So um, we did use it, or more accurately, I used it for um, estimating costs for this Liz Lerman digital archive. That's the dance archive that I referenced earlier that we think will be about 140 terabytes. Um, I did estimate that for AP Trust. Okay. Um, and so they have AP Trust numbers uh, that have been provided as part of the grant. So like I said, we're still getting that content back. Once we have it back and we actually start moving it up into archives, um, you know, yeah, I would actually be able to go back and check the numbers. So, that would be um, interesting when you get to that point. Yeah. I think it'll be cool. Um, you know, as far as I was thinking about the cost models for staffing, um, you know, especially for like the processing hours thing, you know, the closest parallel that I can think of is really the DLF AIG's um, uh, digitization cost calculator, um, because they actually kind of get into, you know, to an extent, the nitty gritty, but it is sort of thing back back when I ran a digital lab. Um, I really would have needed, right? Like if I've got students who aren't insured and they work for, you know, 15 bucks an hour, you know, the time that they're going to spend like removing any sort of like, you know, paper clips and whatnot from any sort of archival materials does need to be accounted for. Um, and that was also very useful for me to articulate up to my higher level administrators to say like, yeah, these students are going to work for this amount of time. We don't pay benefits for them. This is the amount of, you know, like skill basically that they're kind of equipped to do. Whereas then factoring in, okay, then we have some salaried folks who are, you know, do have benefits, etc. So, um, and these are the activities that they're going through. So yeah, it is, I think, pretty difficult to kind of navigate that across like institutional silos, but it does seem pretty key to this process. Other questions for Kate? Okay. Uh, so it looks like then uh, in our January call at the very least, we'll, we'll look at our topics and we will uh, also look at the, the charge and make sure that it's still appropriate for the the group and especially considering the integration of the cloud studies uh, group into the uh, infrastructure interest group. Uh, okay, any other last minute comments, questions before we say goodbye? Uh, okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So then I hope everybody has a happy holiday and we'll We'll see everyone in January. Okay, thank you, Leah. Alrighty, bye bye. Thank Thanks. you, Julian. Bye. Thank you, Kate and David.